Hello and welcome to Development Futures, a podcast brought to you by the Indo-Pacific Development Center here at the Lowy Institute. My name is Roland Raja and I'm the director of the center and your host for this episode. In this podcast, our researchers and other leading experts discuss fresh policy insights and ideas on the most pressing development issues in the world today. In this episode, I'm sitting down with two of our own in-house experts to discuss the outlook for global climate policy with a particular focus on what this means for development. Both of my colleagues are really top quality experts on climate and development, and in particular on climate finance. And I have to say, I always enjoy hearing what they have to say, and I'm really glad to have them both here on the podcast to share their thoughts with all of our listeners. So first, let me give you a brief uh, introduction for both of my colleagues. First is my colleague, Dr. Melanie Pill, who is a climate policy research fellow in the Indo-Pacific Development Center here at Lowy, and specializes in particular on the climate-related issues facing the most vulnerable developing countries. Also, we have our other colleague, Shell Lyons, who is also a climate policy research fellow in the center and specializes in particular <clears throat> on climate energy finance and green banks and has also spent a lot of time working on Australian climate policy. Shell and Melanie, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having us. Yeah, it's great to be here. Uh, so, Melanie, let's go straight to you. You were at uh, COP28, the Global uh, Climate Summit in uh, Dubai, uh, participating in lots of presentations and expert panels. And, you know, one of the big outcomes from COP28 was, of course, the loss and damage fund. It's something uh, right up uh, your alley, an area of expertise uh, for you. Uh, so can you uh, tell us, you know, what is loss and damage uh, all about? And, you know, what do our listeners need to know about uh, this new fund? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, it was indeed a really, a really big milestone after um, over 30 years of sort of inaction uh, on loss and damage. And when we talk about loss and damage um, under the United Nations uh, Framework Convention on Climate Change, we're talking about the impacts that are caused by climate change on, um, on, on countries. Um, and these can be extreme weather events, for example, which are your tropical cyclones and your floods. Um, but we can also, we also talk about slow onset events, um, which are specifically um, uh, detrimental to the Pacific, um, sea level rise, salinization. Um, and then we also look into um, econo non-economic losses, for example, um, things that happen to people, loss of lives, loss of biodiversity, uh, and loss of culture. So these are all intang intangible uh, non-economic loss. And um, there's then human mobility, for example. People already had to move away from coastlines um, and that goes into justice. So it's kind of a never ending story uh, when you talk about loss and damage from climate change. And it, that's why it's not surprising um, that this fund was such a, uh, a major breakthrough for a lot of developing countries. And uh, when it comes to uh, this fund, we had it operationalized at um, COP28. Uh, the uh, governing body uh, of that fund was agreed on, but there were many issues that are still associated with it and they had to talk through, the transitional committee had to talk through um, uh, during the course of 2023. And one particular one was that the World Bank is now the host of the fund for the next four years. Um, that means that some of the processes within the World Bank need to be adjusted in order to fit um, sort of the United Nations uh, system. Um, so the bank system is completely different from what we know uh, in, in the United Nations. Um, then there's also problems with the eligibility criteria, which of the countries are going to be eligible uh, for the funds, uh, which of the countries um, can access the money that is there, what can they access it for, uh, and then also um, very important is the direct access criterion for some of the countries um, and also country ownership uh, of projects. So this all needs to be done throughout the next year um, within the World Bank has a mandate, for example, to uh, to finalize their internal processes within the next eight months. Mm. I guess the, the big question though is, you know, how much funding will there be yeah. for this loss and damage fund? I mean, do we, how much do we know about that? So at the moment we have um, pledges of about 700 million from a few countries that made pledges to the fund, but of course that's nowhere near enough uh, of what is needed to address all the loss and damage that is uh, currently caused by climate change. So I presume there, there, there's quite a long road ahead in terms of not only standing up the fund, but also just funding the fund Absolutely. Uh, properly. Absolutely, yes. Yeah. Um, we're going to come back to climate finance, so I just want to go to you, Shell, now. I mean, the other big outcome from COP28 was 
you know, the language in the final agreement to quote unquote transition away uh, from fossil fuels. Now, I think, you know, the reaction in the media and so forth was, you know, saying how this was a historic first in order, you know, in terms of recognizing this and this kind of language. You know, I suppose for many people, my, you know, myself included, it, it looks like, you know, a fairly small incremental change in language, you know, in a non-binding sort of agreement. And so, you know, it seems like a kind of weak outcome, really, in, in, in many ways. But, you know, you're, you're the sort of expert here. I mean, what's, what's your take? Do you see this as a historic achievement or is it, you know, more of a big letdown? Well, I think... Um you're absolutely right, you know, that it is a very incremental outcome, Roland. And so I think um, there were, it was really interesting that the, the fossil fuel text and outcome received very disparate reactions from various experts in the media. And some people were very dismissive and others, you know, did regard it as a historic breakthrough. And I guess the, the way that you perceive the outcome depends on you know, uh, how you're actually, you know, what criteria you're using to judge it. So if you look at it in terms of the science of climate change and what we actually need to do to reduce emissions, it was completely inadequate. Uh, it was not the, you know, the phase out of fossil fuels that um, the president of the COP had been talking up as we, we led into it. And um, But if you, I think if you look at multilateralism as incrementalism, which is what generally sort of occurs in um, in COPs, is these very small step forwards that, you know, make meaningful change over time and are sometimes sort of interspersed with very significant steps forward. Uh, well, then, you know, it actually, it was significant because it was the first time that um, fossil fuels were sort of uh, mentioned in, in the texts. Uh, and we we have a, a roadmap now to sort of think about where fossil fuels need to go um, uh, through the multilateral negotiations. So, um, you know, I, I think uh, it was disappointing um, given the high hopes that many had leading into the conference, uh, you know, that there would be a breakthrough beyond what had happened in Glasgow and through the, the G7 meeting at Sapporo, um, but it was still a, a small step forward. Mm. So... I suppose, you know, thinking then that, you know, it's about incremental uh, steps forward and then hopefully some occasional break for breakthroughs, you know, I suppose the, the reality is, though, that the, the situation is, is rather urgent and so incrementalism is not always, you know, is not necessarily what we need right now. But, you know, just in terms of global climate policy, I mean, then what's the sort of next steps? What's the next opportunities to sort of build on this and, and, and take us forward? Also, I think um, the UNFCCC plays a really, you know, fundamental role as the key multilateral forum on climate, but its um, its job primarily is to sort of make these incremental steps and set a, a baseline. And so often what we see with, with global climate action is that the really the significant step forwards happen on a bilateral level, uh, often between key emitters, such as the agreement that was brokered on um, accelerating renewable energy between the US and, climate, uh, and China in the lead up to the agreement. And so I think this year is going to be really interesting because we had both special envoys uh, on climate for the US and China retire at the end of last year. And they had had a very constructive relationship, even where the US and China had faced tensions in, in other areas of their relationship. So I will be watching very closely and I expect many other climate analysts to be watching very closely to see how the new appointees to those roles work to accelerate action on climate change in this critical decade. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, um, you know, this this year we also have the election. We have many elections in many countries, but we also have the election um, in the United States where it's quite possible we'll have uh, Donald Trump uh, return to the White House, and he's had particular positions on, on climate change uh, in the past. Melanie, just, just bringing you in here, I mean, if we see another uh, President uh, Trump, um, what, you know, what do you think that, will, that could possibly mean for you know, global climate policy? Yeah, um, so I think uh, we know last time he... Um, backed out of the Paris Agreement, and it was in his intention um, to, to um, leave the Paris Agreement. And obviously, if we uh, have another of those attempts, that would be uh, quite um, a... Uh, it, 
wouldn't maybe disastrous, it would be pretty bad for global climate change action, uh, considering that the US um, needs to be on the table for um, to to um, contribute to uh, yeah to contribute to climate climate change action, um, and so at the moment that conversation hasn't played out as much yet yet in in the US. So um, I guess it remains to be seen, but it might be uh, hopefully not, but might be that we're um, moving backwards a little bit again. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I just want to take us back to. Um you know, when we're talking about climate and development, though, and this is now going some more squarely into both of your areas of, of expertise, when we're talking about climate and development, where the rubber hits the road is really around, um, you know, climate finance. Now, I think this year that's going to be one of the key sort of priorities at, at, the, at, the, at the next uh, COP uh, summit. So maybe, Melanie, just um, sticking with you, can you just give us a bit of a, you know, basic rundown, you know, on where things stand when it comes to, you know, climate climate finance and you know what are, what are the big issues right now yeah sure so um, one of the big issues is that there is probably not enough money to cover it all um, and uh, to go around and um, one of the numbers that is um, out there is that we will need about 2.4 trillion dollars a year um, by 2030 in order to cover the cost of of climate change and one of the biggest issues is actually that there is uh, a concerning gap for adaptation funding, especially in the most vulnerable uh, vulnerable countries. So uh, we know that the needs are about 10 to 18 times greater than what is currently provided. Um, and that is because mitigation is, especially for the private sector, uh, much more uh, attractive to invest in because you have a business case. Um, you, you get your money back and you, you, um, you're making money along the way when you invest into uh, renewable energy. Um, adaptation, on the other hand, is purely an investment and without a financial gain, usually. There are examples where uh, you can have adaptation, where you still have a financial, uh, financial gain if, if you set it up uh, um, uh, correctly. Um, but in general, adaptation need to, needs to come in, in the form of grants. Um, and this year, at the, the next COP, um, we have something that we call the New Collective Goal uh, on Climate Finance, uh, and there will be decided on the quantum of climate finance that is required and what developing, uh, developed countries commit to um, every year. So we used to have um, $100 billion uh, a year, starting from 2009 up till, till now, um, and that goal was only um, met in 2022, um, calculations have just come out from the, the OECD and um, based on what they've counted as climate finance, it looks like if we've, or developed countries have met um, uh, that goal. So one of the problems is that I've just alluded to, what do we count as climate finance? What does actually go into that goal? What can developed countries claim as their contribution um, of the fair share? Um, and then also, what proportion of that goes into adaptation? Uh, what proportion of that goes into mitigation? Are we going to include um, loss and damage in that as well? Um, so these are all things that need to be worked through um, at, at, the, at the next COP. And then also, the question is, um, if we haven't reached 100 billion by now, which is sort of now the, the baseline um, level, um, how good is a, a goal that is even bigger than that if we can't even, even reach it already? Um, mm. right now so okay. yeah and one of the um thanks for that melanie one of, one of the key ways in which you know certainly many countries especially the, the richer countries are looking to plug the climate finance gap is through the multilateral development banks or the mdbs which you know the world bank is the big one but there are others the asian development bank the african uh, development bank and you know basically they are looking to turn these development banks into sort of green development banks. And so I want to bring you in here, Shell, because you've studied a lot of, of green banks. You know, how do you see what's going on here in terms of trying to transform the MDBs into being green development banks rather than just, you know, regular development banks? Well, so thanks, Roland. I think um, it's a really sort of interesting um, question and one that's only going to become sort of um, more prominent as um, the net zero transition advances. So, I mean, 
most multilateral development banks were founded uh, as institutions that were focused on, you know, building economic development and, and sort of um, building key pieces of infrastructure uh, within um, the, the, you know, developing countries. And green banks are quite different types of institutions. So they're usually national level um, institutions. Um, they can be subnational as well but they're domestic institutions which look at accelerating investment in particular technologies to help um, with the, to help catalyze investment for the net zero transition. And so there is there are some times where climate and development goals overlap uh, within those institutions, but there are times where those two goals are incongruous. And so I think that there's a lot of work that needs to be done around, you know, thinking about the how multilateral development banks can be reformed and how their investments can be evaluated so that we're understanding better how uh, they are creating and sort of capturing uh, or destroying value um, to, to sort of help accelerate the net zero transition. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I think, and you, you know, you allude to one of the key issues, I think, in this whole debate around climate and development, particularly when we're talking about climate finance, which is, the extent to which there's, you know, there is a synergy between if you fix the climate crisis, you're, you're, you're fixing the development crisis at the, at the same time. But then there's also the potential for tensions between uh, and trade-offs between these, these two agendas. And I think particularly when we listen to the, you know, you know, policymakers speak, you know, it's not something that people want to readily acknowledge, right? They want to say that it's all synergy and that there's no um, trade-off, but we know, there's only a limited amount of money to go around. Um, a lot of the climate um, finance has been coming out of the pre-existing aid budgets. So it's being rebadged or double dipped or, or repurposed or cannibalized, depending on how you want to look at it. But there's some kind of tension there. I think it's a really difficult, really difficult question, actually. Um, it's one of those sort of wicked problems. But I just want to bring you both in to just sort of say, well, how do you each just think about that? How do you think through what are the synergies and trade-offs when, when you're confronted with, with this issue? Maybe starting with you, Melanie. Yeah, sure. Um, so like you mentioned, there's an increasing call for really making those synergies happen um, between climate change action and development aid. So we have the intergovernmental panel on climate change, the, the um, main uh, scientific body um, of the UNFCCC uh, say that if you do climate change action, you also have a, an opportunity to address the sustainable development goals and have done a nice analysis um, within their report. Um, and countries are continuing to acknowledge that. Um, one issue is, like you said, um, finance it could be stripped away from development uh, budget in order to invest more into uh, into climate change. And if you create those synergies, in theory, you you want to also try and get more bang for your buck, right? You invest into climate change, you do development, you do development, you also create the synergy of doing climate change action, uh, especially nowadays um, with all the uh, geopolitical and uh, inst destabilization of the political economy, um, where also developed countries face uh, tremendous climate change impacts themselves. Um, we have the war raging in the, in the Ukraine. Um, we have the cost of living crisis. We have the war in Palestine. So the dollars get less and less. Um, so, but at the same time, like you said, it's always it's also not always possible. So there are those tensions. Um, some countries have development challenges that kind of need to be addressed first. Um, so for example, in India, there's air pollution, there's waste and there's poverty. So you have a little bit of a trade-off there, um, whether you want to invest into poverty alleviation first or into climate change. Um, and sometimes maybe in such instances or where you, where you don't really know um, what to do or how to do it, thinking about to at least not create perverse outcomes. Um, so increasing the greenhouse gas emissions when you um, do a, a project um, that uh, reduces um, air pollution um, in, in a city, but from a health perspective, not in order to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And there you can see you do it at the same time, but the main objective would be um, to increase people's health and make sure that the, <laughs> the air is actually breathable. Um, rather than desperately trying to combine the two and making sure that you always will have a synergy there. Because mm. it, 
it doesn't always necessarily make sense. So I think that's something we really have to work through, actually, uh, and, and ask ourselves, when can we do it uh, and when, when can't we do it? Um, on the other hand, if you have climate change, or, sorry, if you have development projects and you're building a road or you're building a bridge, you need to make sure that this is really climate proof. Um, so there's no, um, no point of building a road if you know sea level rise will wash it away in five years time. So you need to, you need to still include that climate factor. Mm. So um, something really, uh, yep, yeah, that we have to need to work through in the, in the next um, coming years as well. Mm. And yeah. Mm. No, thanks for that, Melanie. I think it's definitely, as you say, there's a strong, the strongest synergies on the adaptation and development yep. side of things. It's probably more maybe on the mitigation side of things where, where it, it does become a bit more complex. But Shell, I just want to bring you in here. Any, any thoughts on this question? Yeah, so I mean, I totally agree with you both that there is uh, strong tensions between these goals at times, uh, that they can be incongruent. Um, and to give one example, I was recently in Indonesia and, um, you know, they have a very ambitious development goal to become a high income country by 2045. And part of their strategy to achieve this goal is to capture some of the value from the new industries needed in the net zero transition and develop lithium battery and domestic EV manufacturing industries. Now, you know, these industries require a stable power supply and Indonesia has been establishing coal plants to provide power for some of these manufacturing facilities. And I think it's a, you know, a clear example of the complexities in managing climate and development goals. And, you know, we need to, policymakers need to ask themselves, how can Indonesia, with the help of additional climate finance, create these new industries in a way which also allows the world to stay on track to meet its climate goals? And so I guess... You know, I would say that there's two key things that need to happen here. And the first is we need to recognise that climate and development are not the same and they can't use the same amount of funds to deliver double the outcome. So there needs to be an increase in funds. Um, and so the, um, the NCQG pro uh, process through the UNFCCC is going to be very important this year um, and other MDB reforms to scale up finance. But then secondly, I think, you know, we really have... Uh, to a need to evolve our investment governance and evaluation because traditionally governments and the private sector have generally focused on the financial value or financial returns of investments and broader forms of value such as public goods and co-benefits have not often been systematically evaluated or captured and, and the same is true of sort of negative impacts from investments. They often haven't been captured uh, adequately. And I, you know, I think some of the hydro developments in Southeast Asia are a good example of that. But, you know, part of the challenge of the world that we're currently in are the, is the competing policy priorities that governments are facing with these limited resources to address them. And this ultimately means that governments and policymakers need to become more comfortable with making complex trade-offs and um, policy decisions. And so there's a real need for new evaluation tools to understand these policy trade-offs more effectively. Uh, and we're sort of seeing a range of new tools like sustainable taxonomies, um, the ISSB standards being developed to try and help manage these risks and uncertainties and trade-offs better. But more definitely needs to be done in my view and um, policymakers and governments do really need better tools to evaluate how value beyond financial value is created and captured and destroyed in the transition. Well, thanks for that, Shah. I think that's a really many good points, but I think a really great point there. It, more in the synergy space, I suppose, but sort of making sure you're capturing all of the synergies through better evaluation and 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 um, and a project analysis and all of these kinds of things. So, so you you know the, the space for synergy might be bigger than one might think, and and as Melanie said earlier, to avoid the perverse outcomes as well, which you know which is of course a good outcome. It's not you know you don't want it for development. Um, from the development perspective either. But you mentioned um, Indonesia there, Shell, and so that's good because it's actually the next area I wanted to, to bring our conversation. Do you, do you mind if I just oh, jump in? Oh, sure, I have um, just one, one more thing to say on that development climate um, nexus or clash or tension, whatever we want to call it. So I think one important thing, and Shell said that, alluded to that a little bit, is that climate and development are not the same. So it's also not the same people that work on it. So um, one thing that we might have to look at is that policymakers come together within the government and talk to each other when there are projects um, that they 
consulting the people that work on climate when they are development uh, people and, and vice versa. So that's um, probably just a practical thing that often we think, oh yeah, you know, it's it's kind of the same, isn't it? You're, you're working in developing countries and you're um, trying to um, alleviate poverty, help people adapt to climate change, but they're actually not the same. Mm. Um, they're two different hats. Yes, they are similar, but there are different things that you need to take into consideration. That's a really, that's a really yeah. good practical point. Um, yeah, so I, I did want to take the conversation to to to, well, to our part of the world. We're sitting, we're sitting in, in Sydney, um, and Shell's in, in Canberra, um, but we're sitting in Australia and our part of the world in the Indo-Pacific. Um, it is the region that we all uh, f ourselves focus our work on, but it's also a really good region to talk about when we're talking about climate and development because, you know, we do have big um, dynamic emerging economies in Asia like Indonesia or Vietnam or India um, where you know, they are developing countries, development's very important, but they're also absolutely critical to the global net zero uh, transition. They're a source of growing emissions. And then we've also got the, you know, the Pacific Island countries, which basically contribute nothing, virtually nothing to global emissions, but of course, you know, bear the brunt of all the worst effects of, of climate change. So maybe um, just sticking with you, uh, Shell, I mean, if we're talking particularly around um, Southeast Asia, which is a particular focus of ours, you know, what are the sort of big priorities? What needs to happen, uh, particularly from that kind of climate finance angle? Where's climate finance can play a role? Yeah, so I think this is a really interesting question, Roland, and one that, you know, I know you and I are spending a lot of time sort of thinking about deeply at the moment. Uh, and, you know, Southeast Asia is a really critical region uh, and the Paris Agreement will not ex will not succeed in its temperature goals and, and limiting warming to uh, 1.5 or 2 degrees if Southeast Asia does not succeed on its net zero transition. And towards the end of last year, the International Energy Agency released some really sobering data, which examined how much renewable energy was expected to be installed in various countries and regions over the next five years. And this received quite a bit of media attention because China is uh, expected to install over 2000 gigawatts of renewable energy uh, capacity. But really, I think the most important story in that data was that ASEAN countries are significantly off track at present, and their forecast to only install 63.1 gigawatts um, of wind and solar, which is well below the 229 gigawatts that they need to keep the net zero targets underpinning the Paris Agreement alive. So, you know, the key question I think here is why are ASEAN countries off track? You know, their economic growth um, is, has been really impressive. Uh, and this is something that we have been looking at quite a bit at the Lowy Institute. And ASEAN countries really face a dual challenge because they, they need to decarbonise their existing electricity supply whilst also building additional new capacity to, um, to sort of deal with their strong forecast uh, electricity growth. And there's a really range, complex range of barriers to um, you know, scaling up renewable energy storage and transmission investments in Southeast Asia. Uh, and these include, you know, that many of the markets in these countries are sort of run by state owned entities and are not competitive. Um, there are a lot of them that are heavily subsidized. Some of them have ele excess electricity capacity. Some have stringent local content requirements and many have um, significant electricity planning coordination issues. And all of these things discourage investments and need to be kind of straightened out in order to have the investment dollars flow. Uh, and then on top of that, even when you sort of have the right regulatory and policy settings for investment, there's a huge skills challenge in sort of making sure you have all of the electricians ready to string wires onto transmission poles and to build the renewable energy uh, installations that are needed and the storage. And so I think, at this point, this very critical moment in the net zero transition, it's really something that all ASEAN countries and all ASEAN allies need to be sort of laser focused on. Um, and, and everybody needs to be trying to help uh, ASEAN sort of, you know, make sure that this uh, transition is scaled up at the same time that, you know, Australia and the US and other Indo-Pacific allies are also focused on their own transitions because this, this IEA data does show that we have a, a significant problem with that um, that sort of investment transition and um, net zero transition at the moment. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I think that's a really you know interesting point as well that you make, Shell, because um, one of the things you're pointing out along the way there is that you know, in many ways, we just said earlier, all three of us, about the need for more climate finance, but there's an issue also on the absorptive capacity side of, of countries on the, on the other end of this, right? In, in this case, um, Southeast Asia, where it's not so straightforward just to pump money in, right? And, and, and to get more investment um, and therefore reductions uh, in emissions. Um, we, we know that also, I mean, Southeast Asia is important also because it's, it's actually been on the receiving end of these, of these big uh, new just energy transition partnership uh, deals or jet peas. I think 20, if I get the numbers right, 20 billion in Indonesia and 12 billion or so uh, commitment for Vietnam. So these are quite big. Um, they're quite exciting in a sense because it's the international community, principally the G7, really stepping up with some big emerging economies uh, to finance the clean energy and transition and, and put some money on the table. No, not much in the way of grants, um, but you know, loans and, and blended finance from the private sector and these kinds of things. I mean, how, just very quickly, Shell, I mean, how do you see that going? Do you see that as promising? I know there's been some, some issues along the way, um, but what do you think about the, these jet peas? Uh, absolutely. I think they're promising. Um, and, you know, yes, there are sort of um, complex issues um, in setting them up and making sure the money flows, but I think they're a really critical part of a successful net zero transition in ASEAN. And I really hope that they continue to be sort of utilised as one of the, the sort of key tools in the, the transition in the region, because um, without that additional investment from G7 countries, it's going to be very, very challenging for, uh, for the, the ASEAN region, region to meet their um, net zero goals. Mm. Okay, so switching from you know, these big emerging economies now to the Pacific Islands, we also do a lot of work on the Pacific. Melanie, that's a, a real uh, focus of yours, the most vulnerable countries when it comes to many things, but the impacts of climate change. Um, so, you know, aid is also a big deal in the Pacific as well. So, you know, what are the big issues and priorities right now from that climate and development, but also that climate finance perspective from, yeah, in your view? Yeah, absolutely. So one of the the highest priorities for the Pacific is really uh, climate change adaptation uh, and making sure that um, countries are resilient and resilient to shocks, uh, especially extreme weather events, but then also uh, slow onset events such as uh, sea level rise, we've already talked about that, but also uh, an interesting one for the Pacific is salinization, uh, where the soil becomes too saline and crops can't grow. Um, so these are circumstances that the Pacific really needs to adapt to because even if they, like you mentioned, reduce all their greenhouse gas, gas emissions to zero, the trajectory, the global trajectory of reaching our 1.5, it, it wouldn't change. We're currently on the trajectory to almost, I think, 2.3 uh, uh, degrees uh, Celsius increase in global um, uh, average warming uh, and if the Pacific uh, got to net zero that wouldn't change any of that trajectory so all they can do is adapt to the impacts that are already happening um, and obviously that means that they would need grants and even if they do mitigation projects these projects would be energy security um, and creating resilience rather than uh, reduction of greenhouse gas emissions in order to achieve our goal so there's the difference between Southeast Asia and the Pacific here. Um, and what the Pacific needs, I guess, from the global community is deep emissions cuts from global actors. Um, and I think Australia can really back this up here uh, and action accordingly, advocate for the Pacific, but also uh, look into their own um, domestic policies. I do think that the climate change component in that development strategy is, is a good move and acknowledges that then more needs to be happen as part of the... Um, the development aid, but also uh, needs to continue through bilateral uh, funds um, with the Pacific uh, as well as Australia. Mm. Yeah, yeah. You, you you bring Australia in, and I suppose it, it's it's hard not to, given Australia is the the main sort of um, you know rich country and and and, and power in, in the region and the biggest the biggest donor. Um, but you know Australia you know has a role to play in in terms of the global net zero transition, in terms of supporting Southeast Asia, in terms of supporting. Uh, the Pacific. Um, so, you know, we Australia is a, a you know a rich country um, and a high per capita emitting uh, country as well, and a fossil fuel exporter. So, a lot of things that suggest a high level of responsibility. 
Um, at the same time, as you say, you know, there's action domestically on climate policy, but there's also a new uh, development strategy from Australia which prioritizes uh, climate change. So just maybe very quickly, um, what are your sort of thoughts from each of you I'd like to hear about, you know, what's Australia's role in all of this? What are a couple of things that, you know, we, we need to focus on? Maybe um, starting with you, Melanie. Um, yeah, sure. So one thing is that Australia needs to maintain, I, I believe in that strongly, remain their global um, credibility as a, as a climate change player, um, which um, they have started to to improve um, over, over, especially last year um, at COP28. So um, it needs to remain credible uh, within the rich countries, like you said, uh, the, providing their fair share uh, of climate change finance, for example. Um, but then also balance the interests of the Pacific um, who welcome those bilateral funds um, as they are easier to access for them rather than the Green Climate Fund and those multilateral uh, funds that are out there. And um, I think one... One um, thing that I also wanted to mention earlier is that Australia also has a really um, good opportunity with COP31. Australia is hosting, hopefully co-hosting COP31 with the Pacific. So there's a bid that's on the table um, and Australia wants to, to do that. Um, Australia really has an opportunity there um, to advocate for those specific issues, um, to advocate for adaptation and to ensure um, that the fossil fuel language that um, Shell uh, talked about gets stronger and stronger and that maybe at one point we actually get to a phase out rather than transitioning out, um, of, out, of, out of fossil fuels. So that can be Australia's role um, domestically or regionally. Mm. And, and Shell, any anything from from you as well? I know you, you've also spent a lot of time working on Australian uh, climate policy. So the idea of a of a COP thirty one potentially being co hosted from Australia must sound very very exciting to you, at the very least. Uh, yeah, it's exciting, and I think um, it's probably also quite a daunting um, challenge in some ways. It would be the largest diplomatic event that we've ever hosted, so it would be a really um, yeah, a really big challenge to sort of uh, pull it all together in the next couple of years, but an extremely rewarding one that I think Australia and the Pacific would be able to um, do it sort of an excellent job uh, in managing. And so, I mean, I think um, that I would absolutely agree with Melanie that we, Australia has a very important role to play uh, on the international stage. Uh, for all the reasons you mentioned, Roland, you know, we are a wealthy country, we are a fossil fuel exporter, we do have high per capita emissions. So, you know, if Australia is working really hard to accelerate its transition and being a, a positive actor on the world stage, it really sets an example to other countries around our region and around the world um, to, to sort of step up as well. And it increases pressure on those who don't. And I think uh, we really saw that, um, you know, at COP uh, recently when uh, Minister Bowen uh, was very sort of uh, firm in some of his language around supporting stronger action around a range of different different measures, including the, the fossil fuel text. Uh, and, you know, I think that that's something that uh, will hopefully kind of continue um, as, you know, we you look to host and have that the bid um, for COP finalised. And I think the other really um, sort of exciting area that Australia can uh, play a significant role going forward is building upon the very strong work that we have done traditionally in the measurement, reporting and verification space. Because, you know, if you're not actually accounting for emissions properly, then, you know, the, the whole kind of um, basis of the net zero transition is, is not on firm ground. And Australia has been very constructive over the years in helping to support development of agriculture, emissions accounting, of um, methane, of blue carbon accounting. And so I think uh, we have a real role in, in sort of continuing to try and develop best practice for emissions accounting and for constantly, you know, helping to update our own systems and helping, to, you know, um, to set those international best benchmarks for best practice. Um, so that would be another sort of more technical area that one where I think we can actually play a, an important role going forward. Mm. Oh, well, thank you for that, um, Melanie. Did you? Want yeah, to say I just want to well? jump in on yep. on the uh, COP28 and the language that Minister um, uh, Bowen used. I was uh, quite pleased to hear his um, 
final remarks or some of his final remarks at the um, closing uh, plenary, and I think um, it came through from a lot of wealthy or rich countries, including the US, Germany, uh, and Australia, that they would have hoped for stronger language on the fossil uh, fuel um, transition phase out, phase down. Um, so they, they would have liked to see stronger language there, and I, was, I found it was quite refreshing to see that Australia was back on the table. Um, with that. So, um, and, and then when we look at COP31 with our elections coming up next year, um, no matter which government will be uh, in power, Australia has to deliver because we're co-hosting it with Pacific. Mm. So, yeah. Mm. Yeah, so it's a bit of a you know positive sort of outlook, I suppose, or, the, or another way of putting it, the pressure yes. would definitely be, be on for yep. Australia if, if, we, if, we get, if we win this bid. Um, now, one of the things that both of you know, we're sort of coming to either the funnest or hardest part of the podcast. Is one, you both know we like to end our podcast with a final question to our expert guests where we ask you to, to put forward your own big ideas about you know, what the world or what Australia or, or wh what whoever should do uh, in order to address the issues that we've all uh, been talking about during the episode. Um, so that's climate change, that's climate finance, that's climate and development. So maybe um, starting with you, Shell, I mean, what, what's, what are your sort of some big ideas you'd like to put on the table in terms of um, how the world and, and we all could do better? Oh, well, I think from the discussion that we've had, Roland, it's pretty clear that there is a significant gap in the level of climate finance that's required to meet the goal of Paris um, and the, the current levels uh, that we, we're seeing that are being dispersed. And even with ambitious multilateral development bank reform, there's still going to be a sizable gap. So for me, the, the question is, what do we need um, to do at the multilateral and the national levels to try and fill this gap? And so I've got a couple of different solutions um, that you know I, we're working on uh, in the work that we're doing at Lowy. Uh, so first, you know, the multilateral development banks that were born out of Bretton Woods uh, are not really designed uh, specifically to deal with the modern challenges that we're facing. And so, you know, there's a real need for a new form of multilateral bank that more effectively meets climate and development objectives, uh, which is the focus, you know, of a report that you, I and another colleague, Grace Stanhope, are, are, are writing. Um, and our solution is really to take the strongest elements of MDBs of export finance agencies and of green banks like Australia's Clean Energy Finance Corporation, and to use those to create a new form of multilateral development bank that sits under the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework. Um, and in doing so, you'd have a bank that geographically sits at the heart of the net zero transition, that puts rising powers like India and Indonesia at the heart of its governance, and that leverages public finance in a very efficient and effective way to shape the rate and the direction of clean, the clean energy transition. So uh, stay tuned uh, for our report on what an IPEF bank could look like and could achieve. Um, but I do think that that is a really key piece of the puzzle in the, the multilateral climate finance landscape. And then secondly, at the national level, there's a huge need to accelerate clean energy industries in ASEAN, as we've spoken about. Uh, and I think an important part of the solution uh, is to look at their current institutions um, and to look at the, the role of green banks um, as, a, as an institutional tool in Southeast Asian countries. Uh, so green banks provide debt and equity financing for the net zero transition and finance projects that are commercially viable but that can't source private finance because either the investment is first of a kind uh, in the, the country that it's being deployed in or the financial structure of the, the transaction needs to be innovative and the transaction costs associated with developing that structure are too expensive for commercial banks to, to take on that takes it's too time consuming um, but you know the CEFC Australia's Green Bank has been very successful in you know financing a range of innovative technologies and investments and to, to really catalyze the clean energy transition in key segments like large-scale solar and offshore wind oh, sorry and onshore wind um, and while not all of the lessons from Australia's green bank experience are transferable to Southeast Asia many of those lessons are and so I really um, hope that we uh, look at scaling up our expertise in terms of sharing knowledge about green bank governance and functions to help more um, of our neighbours in Southeast Asia over um, the coming years. 
Thank you, Shell. And maybe final word um, to you, Melanie. Yeah, what sure. are your uh, yeah. big ideas? Um, so one of my big ideas is um, related to the loss and damage fund, surprise. Um, so I would like to, or what I'm trying to uh, sometimes think about is how can that fund be set up properly and, you know, that it's working for the most vulnerable countries. And uh, I think one promising blueprint, and maybe people don't really look into that um, a lot, uh, is the European Solidarity Fund. I think it has some really good characteristics that we could use in order to um, further shape the loss and damage fund. For example, um, it would overcome some of the challenges, for example, how much money do you get in the case of an extreme weather event? So the European Solidarity Fund doesn't cover all of the costs that are associated with the loss and damage caused um, by a flood, for example, um, because they, or well, the fund acknowledges that there's certain responsibility of the country themselves, but also not all of the um, losses and damages are caused by climate change because there were always cyclones um, in the Pacific or in the Caribbean, for example. Um, so that would overcome some of those challenges of attribution. Um, there's also flexibility on how countries can spend that money. They can spend it on non-economic losses, for example. And obviously not everything would work, but some of the features I think uh, would be worth looking at. And um, I would also like to see um, Another discussion on whether the Green Climate Fund might not be something that is more suitable um, to host a loss and damage sort of facility fund or whatever you want to call it in the future um, and re-evaluating that once the, the host, uh, the World Bank um, as the host comes to an end um, after the four years. I mean, it, it can work. It, it would be great if it does, but if not, that's maybe something um, we should again, look into. And the other thing is, um, we've already discussed, and Shell said it is all finance is an obvious problem. Um, development in climate um, in, in any of the, and, and all of the above. Um, and there's the constant call for innovative funding solutions um, and engaging the private sector. And so sometimes I wonder, so what, what is innovative finance solution? And um, we need to look into philanthropies. And so I've been thinking about that. And I think uh, if we, and, and we need more grants. And when we talk about the private sector, it's often about, like you mentioned, Shell, it's the banks, it's, um, you know, investment. But what about if we tap into really those philanthropists, that innovative finance source to provide grants, to create a strategic funding stream for multilateral funds, maybe for the Green Climate Fund, the Adaptation Fund, the Loss and Damage Fund. Um, maybe they can even have it direct access through regional or country um, organizations but they are providing grants and strategically making use of that money because a lot of money a lot of that money is spent um, but it's not strategically spent and with a purpose so what if we create a pool uh, of philanthropists that then um, can funnel some of that funding towards climate change action so uh, that's, yeah. that's that's very good thank you for that melanie and and shell i mean um very uh very specific practical pragmatic uh policy orientated uh suggestions which is exactly what we we like uh, to specialize in here so um that was, that's really good and uh, fantastic uh discussions i hope uh, our listeners uh got a lot out of that um but uh, we'll we'll have to leave the conversation here so thank you both uh, for joining me uh, on this podcast You've been listening to Development Futures, a podcast from the Indo-Pacific Development Centre at the Lowy Institute, hosted by Institute experts, produced by my colleague Josh Godding, and supported by the Australian Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. Development Futures is part of the Lowy Institute podcast network. Find all our podcast series on our website. Thanks for listening.